hello and welcome to the Monday edition of the DC Today. I am recording uh, from our house out in East Hampton. I just got in a couple of hours ago. Very busy weekend in the city after a week of travel and a lot of research today I'm kind of excited about. The DC Today Monday is always uh, intended to be a little longer, the written version I sort of follow a template that I had created in the aftermath of COVID and markets.com for those of you that remember that. And we go through market action and, and public policy and the Fed and economic data, uh, you know, just these different categories that we used to kind of write off of. And so all of that is stuff we're going to go through right now. And then the Ask David, where we have real life questions. They're never made up at all. It's real questions from readers that we try to answer one every day, and today we have two. I want to go through that a little as well. The Monday edition also has um, a special column we do called Against Doomsdayism, and uh, the attempt there is to just highlight some different factoids, some reinforcement uh, of the fact that, in fact, the world is not ending and that we have various empirical support indicating that uh, doomsday uh, is sort of a different interpretation of the way the things are going versus uh, reality that indicates an awful lot of improvement for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. So we will um, do all that today. And I just wanted to kind of reinforce what the Monday edition is about. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to continue using DC Today to give market updates and, and ask David and any other kind of um, market factoid or news of the day that is relevant. Very often, I'm the one bringing that to you. Uh, I'll bring in Brian Seitel, sometimes Trevor Cummings. Uh, we like the idea of different partners and advisors and members of the investment team at TBG uh, filling in from time to time with that. And then, of course, Friday is the Dividend Cafe. This last Friday's Dividend Cafe. I encourage you to listen to it or watch it or uh, my favorite, read it. If you haven't yet, we have just a little refresher on our philosophy about dividend growth, and it seems to have created a lot of feedback. And so I, I welcome your feedback as well uh, in terms of Dividend Cafe's uh, affirmation of our dividend growth investment philosophy. So the market today ended up being up. Futures had pointed uh, down last night, and uh, even uh, pre-market this morning, the market technically did open down 30, 40 points, but uh, almost immediately moved into positive territory and stayed there throughout the day and closed just off of its high of the day. The um, uh, market, though, was not uniformly up. You did have basically every defensive sector down today. And by defensive, I mean um, utilities, consumer staples, healthcare, uh, real estate, things that are generally considered to be more defensive in nature versus higher beta areas. Speaking of higher beta, the uh, technology sector was the best performing today and financials um, not far behind. And so it was kind of a, a mixed bag in terms of results, but the Dow closed at its high level of 2023 today, which is just shocking, uh, up 76 points. The S&P was up uh, 39 basis points and the NASDAQ was up 93 basis points uh, behind that technology movement. Uh, the bond market was up a little bit. The 10-year was down 1.5 basis points. So you have a 10-year yield sitting at 3.8%. We're going to talk about that in a moment with the Ask David. And then you, do, you did have um, oil down a little bit, but of course it had a huge rally last week. And so... By way of uh, public policy, one thing I think needs to be pointed out. I don't know what will end up happening with this for a reason I'll explain in a moment. But Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, he finds his way into the D.C. today for a number of reasons on a number of occasions. But Senator Joe Manchin um, announced over the weekend, I believe it was actually Friday, his intention to oppose the Biden administration's nomination of, um, for Secretary of Labor, Julie Sue. And, and, and Julie Sue is a very far left progressive. She had supported uh, AB5 when she was the California Secretary of Labor, which was the assembly bill that really kind of uh, almost got rid of independent contractors. It was um, uh, very uh, problematic in the state of California for a kind of freedom in how um, 
one provides services to a company either through a W-2 employee or those who want more independence as an independent contractor. So things like that have kind of weighed on her. But because there was a departure, she's serving as Secretary of Labor now in interim capacity without Senate approval to the cabinet position. And so whether or not they may just try to continue extending her interim role or give up and go find a different Secretary of Labor or, or see if they will end up getting the votes. With Senator Manchin saying no, they still technically could be 50-50, but, um, and that would enable her to pass with a tie-breaking vote from Vice President Harris. But the assumption is that either Mark Kelly in Arizona or uh, Kirsten Sinema in Arizona or maybe even John Tester in Montana would also oppose at least one of those three, likely. And so I don't think she has the vote, so we'll have to wait and see what happens. But there, there's a lot on the line there about the Secretary of Labor. Personnel is policy, and particularly with a lot of the antitrust things going on and various other regulatory apparatus, the Labor Secretary matters, and so we'll continue to follow that. On the economic front, um, I'm going to start with China, because the big news last night was that China's GDP growth the second quarter came in at 6.3% year over year, which, of course, Americans would kill for, but it was below expectation and sequentially going quarter over quarter to ignore the base effect of how low things were in their economic growth a year ago. Quarter over quarter, uh, it was underwhelming. It was only 0.8% and it had been 2.2 in Q1 from the prior quarter. So uh, slowing down growth, a lot of that having to do with the consumer very weak in, in China, and, and then the business expenditures, CapEx, very low behind their troubled property sector. I don't much care about consumer confidence, as you know, but it did come out in America or anywhere. It did come out on Friday, and uh, the University of Michigan consumer confidence level jumped quite a bit from 64.4 last month to 72.6 this month. That's well below the pre-COVID 105 level. It's still way down, but it's moved up quite a bit more than people would have expected at this point. Um, I do want to remind people, I read a bulletin this morning. There's a certain economist. I'm not going to say his name now because I don't want to be critical. And actually, it's somebody I like quite a bit most of the time. But um, he'd written a, a bulletin this morning just wanting to remind people that, you know, it's still very likely we had a recession and, and uh, credit conditions have tightened a lot. And, and you know, there's someone who's been screaming that there'll be a recession nonstop for 18 months. And I just think it's worthwhile for me to remind people that a short-term recession call, you know, people could end up being act right about it because the broken window, people that scream for a recession for nonstop for two years and or three years or whatever it ends up being and eventually get one, you can decide if that was a right call or wrong call. But I think it's entirely possible you'd get one without the market responding. It's not really that pertinent if you have a recession short-term if the market doesn't respond from an investment standpoint. And so there's a lot more to ask than just, will you end up getting a recession? Right now, there's it seems to be more and more moving in the soft landing camp. Um, but I just want to point out that the long-term thing we do know seems a lot more significant than the short-term thing we don't know. And the short-term thing we don't know is whether or not we have a recession, and if we do, when, and if we do, how deep, and if we do, how the market will respond. There's about four I don't know and no one else either no one else knows either things there, four things. And then the long-term thing is something I think we do know, which is that there's an excessive amount of indebtedness that weighs on global growth. And that's a 10-year, a 20-year, maybe a 30-year story. And then we're talking about whether or not we have a recession next month or next quarter. I just, I don't, I don't know what to say. Keep your eye on the ball of things that matter. All right, what else do I want to discuss here? I'm looking at uh, today's bullets. Um, the housing market, this is, fin I, I shared it last week, but this is just phenomenally interesting. 92% of Americans we shared last week have a mortgage below 6%. And that explains the lack of incentive to sell a home now at a lower mortgage to buy something that you'd have to get a mortgage around 7% for. Fair enough. But to put more color on this, of that 92%, 23% have a mortgage below 3%. And 61% have a mortgage below 4%. So we're not just talking about people having a lower rate that would go higher, but in well over half the cases, a significantly lower rate. And that is the reason so many are frozen in place here and you just can't get any activity 
to uh, allow prices to reset higher or lower. Um, by the way, that against doomsdayism, I'll read real quickly. I often skip it in the podcast and video, but I think it's worthwhile noting that the global literacy rate in the early 19th century um, was 12, the literacy rate was 12%. Okay, 12% of the world's population could read and write. Today, it is 83%. So people that are of reading and writing age, 83% can read and write around the world. And it was 12% less than 200 years ago. I think that is just remarkable. Remarkable. And only a hyper-literate society like ours, where we take it for granted as a given, could possibly not find it remarkable. All right, so someone asked me how we go about weighting uh, making adjustments to the weightings of what we do in stocks in our portfolio, managing our, our dividend growth portfolio that we manage in-house here at the Bonson Group. And I think there's two quick distinctions I want to make for you. One is when we are affecting trades in our portfolio up to a target weighting, like we didn't change a target weighting, but a stock has fallen in the portfolio below its target weighting and we're buying more to bring it up or we're trimming some of the stock to bring it down. So a stock could have dropped and it just mathematically sits below its weighting. It was 3%, it fell to 2.5%, where a stock was 25 and it went up to 3 And at that point, we're either trimming just as a means of bringing down risk, or we're adding up to be opportunistic on price weakness. And that's, an that's a decision we make, Brian and I, uh, in terms of our portfolio management, working with our investment committee, our analyst, uh, we meet every single Monday. We are uh, dialoguing throughout the day electronically and telephonically and in person, um, hundreds of communications a day. And then their formal meeting where decisions get made Monday. And, and you know, we generally, um, if we think a stock has dropped and we don't want to own anymore, we'd be selling it. And so when it drops and we want to buy more, it's opportunistic and we want to trim, but we're not changing the weighting, it's risk mitigation. And I've talked about that before. But then when we're actually changing the weighting, oftentimes it's just simply opportunity cost and, and conviction and valuation and all those things kind of coming together. So we could have a company that's just been a phenomenal dividend grower. And yet now current yield has gotten very low because the stock price has grown so much. And we want to continue owning that dividend growth in the future, but at current level, we want to weight it lower to add for some higher yielders into the portfolio. So we may bring a name that was 25 or 3% weighting, bring it down to 1.5%, and, and yet um, uh, go find another name that we have a more conviction in, or is it a lower valuation, or we see opportunity for more dividend growth. And so it generally changing the weighting is valuation-oriented, and uh, weight, and then uh, trading around a current weighting that we're not changing is either risk management if it's trimming or buying up is opportunistic. I hope that answers that question. Someone else had then asked, and, and it was just based on kind of a false premise. It looks like the 10-year um, bond yield, uh, that 4% is near the higher end of historical yields for a 10-year treasury. So if so, is it possible that you know, uh, cutting the, the rate wouldn't even um, uninvert the yield curve. Cutting the short-term rate wouldn't uninvert the yield curve because the long end would just drop more. But um, the, the, I put a chart in DC Today today to show that no, no, no. The 10-year has been always over 4% until the financial crisis. It's only been at or lower than 4 since the Fed went to a mo uh, this hyper-low rate environment. And so the reason for that, as I talk about all the time with the Japanification thesis, is uh, expectations for downward pressure on growth. And downward pressure on growth puts bond yields at the longer end of the curve lower. And right now, if that number is priced in, something between 3.5% and 4% for the time being could very well go lower. But if they cut the Fed funds rate 100 basis points, you would uninvert the yield curve more than 100 basis points but at, at some point, we most certainly would uninvert the yield curve. But the long-term interest rates for the 10-year have changed um, in more recent years, and it's a byproduct of lower expectations on growth. All right, I'm going to leave it there. I think we've covered a few different things. I always love you reading the 
actual written version of the dctoday.com. Reach out with any questions you have. Um, we are getting deeper in earnings season. A number of big banks reported Friday, mostly with pretty darn good news. The stock prices had gone up, and then they kind of gave some of that back on Friday, um, but but today moved uh, higher across most financials. But you know that, that we're really brand new into earnings season, so we have all this week with a ton of names coming, and the next week even more. We'll watch earnings season and continue to do what we do each and every day at the Bonson Group. Should be a busy week ahead. I'm kind of excited for it. So thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thanks for reading the DC today. Please reach out. Questions at thebonsongroup.com and have a wonderful evening. Take care. Mm -hmm.